Welcome everybody to St John's Church this Sunday morning. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing two wonderful performers. I've, I haven't heard them live, but I have heard them um, on recordings. Um, I'd like to first introduce Bob Jensen, born in New Brunswick, now lives in the beautiful Prince Edward Island in Canada. And when he was 17, he was inspired by Willie Guthrie to hitchhike 9,000 miles. And then at 18, he wrote his, the first song, First Time Since August. So he started being an intrepid person quite young in life. Um, um, with lines like, all the things you want to do by the time you're 22. Um, he wrote The Ritz Cafe about um, um, being lonely in the big city. Um, but he's also more recently written, um, uh, written books, um, including one, um, about the artist, um, interpreting the artist Mark Chagall's poems, uh, Mark Chagall's paintings. And Bob Jensen wrote a hundred poems inspired by him. And I think it's quite fitting because Mark Chagall also did beautiful stained glass um, windows. And we're, we're in a church this morning, so I think that's really lovely. And Tony McManus um, come, was born in Paisley near Glasgow and Scotland and now lives in Canada. Um, he not only plays Celtic music, um, but also um, jazz, bluegrass, uh, and more. And halfway through a PhD, <laughs> halfway through a PhD in maths, he abandoned academia for music, and I think we're going to be very glad this morning that he did so. Um, he's also written for film, for um, Neil Jordan's film On Dean, uh, and uh, they're with us this morning, so please let's give them a great port very welcome. Bob Jensen. Thank you. I pray thee, show me kindness when you break the morning sky. Send your light forth softly that I might adjust my eyes. And careful what you sing to wake me from my grateful sleep. For the fairest song upon the land is sure to make me weep. And though I love the moon, I know I must embrace the day, though the raindrops on the windows of my soul are smudged and gray. Will you send a drop of sunshine to quench this thirsty heart, to keep my voice from breaking when the parching day does start? Thank you. So we're gonna do some uh, poetry uh, with music and uh, I've convinced Tony to do a, a little bit of uh, solo guitar work. And uh, in, in this beautiful space, um, uh, a lot of the poems uh, that we're gonna do today are uh, reverential and, and uh, tie in one way or another uh, with uh, spirituality. Um, in Atlantic Canada, where I live, um, nature's greatest act is autumn. We have a lot of maple trees, we have a lot of deciduous uh, trees and coniferous trees, and uh, when the fall colors are at their peak, it can seem that the mountains are on fire on a brilliant sunny day. And so I was out on such a day, and um, I wrote this little poem, I call to God in three small words. Before this blazing bonfire of the vanities of God, when soft the warm west wind is a feather on my face, playful as the infant's laughing eyelashes, a monarch in the sweet caress of flight. These ears and eyes of God, this breath stolen of wonder, the hungry skin of solitude, a mouth that chafes for one small drop of nectar to quench the thirst for color in the soul. I am high upon this holy breeze, basking in the warmth of the valley's maple embers, as roaming bees of southbound geese, geese herald in the dawn and split the morning sky like kindling for yearning in the hungry hearth of man. Dividing into realms of east and west, the captive heavens, 
each of whom would kill the fatted calf and claim the wayward son as its own. Raise your arms in wonder, cast the shadow of a dove, expel your final breath to God in three small words. It is done, for the heart of man is crucified upon this peaceful hill where providence is burning for beauty on its knees. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, you may be familiar with a 20th century uh, composer of piano music by the name of Eric Satie. He wrote some very beautiful music and, and some of it was quite odd. Um, but I'm, I'm a fan and uh, one of my favorite piece by Satie is something called Nausean No. 1. And uh, Tony did a record of classical music a few years back. And when I heard his version of Nausean 1, it, was, it conveyed such emotion that I thought I, I just have to write a poem around Tony's music. And so I tried to listen to what Tony was attempting to convey with his reading of that piece. And I came up with something I call the plover's nest. As I chase the heathered path between the ivory sea and heaven, the gannet acrobatics fairly lift my buoyant eyes. Though I'm light upon the sweet grass as a soul that's fully leavened, I do not see the plover's tiny nest there on the skies. For the heavens call a man as they hail a coltish boy a compass for the drunken heart, and the feet that leave the earth in a mitigated joy are heedless to the undiscerning path that they will turn. And when I fall from heaven, drunk and graceless and alone. is the fool whose path he does impel with carelessness upon this joyful run for each time I've been unkind or tread upon a tiny shell regret is like the helpless trout laid in the midday sun and when I fall from heaven drunk and graceless
fall from heaven, drunk and graceless and alone. I pray I will not crush that tiny shell upon those unforgiving stones. Beautiful Tony. I find inspiration in all sorts of places. And uh, Vincent van Gogh uh, used to talk about these moments of incredible clarity he would experience. He said, uh, I experience a period of frightening clarity in those moments when nature is so beautiful, I am no longer sure of myself, and the paintings appear as in a dream. And, and I think everybody has moments like that when there's a day or a moment that's so perfect that you just kind of feel at one with everything. You feel like you're in the center of the universe. I, I know I experience that sometimes, and it, it always feels like a gift. And so I've written a poem that tries to describe that, and uh, it's set to um, one of the Bach uh, cello suites, which Tony's not going to do on a cello. <laughs> Be grateful for that. <laughs> I call this the ecstasy of one. You ready to go? Dawn is never tentative nor timid, nor commiserate to those who dread its light. It illuminates the evil and the good the fearful and the brave, and sends its lush rains to the meadows of the just and the unholy without prejudice or favor. It does not possess an ear to hear the prayer of the afflicted, nor a heart to feel the terror of its first encroaching rays upon those who taste its hunger or receive its burning sky. Nor will dawn be rushed to climax by those who seek its beauty for the sake of the impatient or the fumbling hand of chastity. The first faint rays will pulsate softly through swollen thunderheads and slowly build towards a symphonic crescendo of light erupting on the naked horizon in an atmospheric coupling that will leave the voyeur trembling on the shores of Mother Ocean, on the shores of the new morning, on the shores of eternity and of the artistry of God. To the young, the summer days will linger, timeless love in dappled orchards, salty afternoons on August endless shores, cotton batten luster on a cobalt shattered sky, aching with the fervent love of union and a visceral awareness, the ecstasy of one, eternal to those who are lost in its sensual embrace, consumed like moths in its conjugal flame, drawn to the rim of that shining cup, on one side the abyss, on the other the ecstasy of one, outside of time, immune to the setting sun, surrounded by eternity on all sides, open-ended to the tiniest of minds, the immaculate conception of the unlearned, faith and eternity, indistinguishable, held by the smallest hand, tight and warm and sticky, clutched not with trepidation, but with reckless abandon, days without end, dreams without waking, waves that are unbroken, tides that never fall, flight like the albatross who never touches down. Stand and face the sun, open the palms of your hands, and accept nothing but the warm rays upon your skin, the fragrant breeze inside your nostrils, the fervent love of union, the ecstasy of one. Accept everything that you can change and that you cannot change, that you love and that you hate. Deny the setting sun, for the warm rays on your face bind you to it, and you may impede its orbit with cables of desire, with the 
fervent love of union in the ecstasy of one. Thank you. So because we're in a church, uh, I thought I would uh, try this poem. Tony's never heard this one, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it solo. Um, I, I'm working on all kinds of different projects, and one of, the, one of my great inspirations is scripture. Um, I've always thought that some of the greatest poetry is in the King, King James Version of the Bible, Proverbs, Psalms, and uh, in particular, I love the Song of Songs. Uh, by King Solomon. And so I decided that I would try to interpret the Gospels through poetry. And uh, uh, from the Beatitudes, we have Blessed are the Merciful, Matthew 5, 7. And uh, that's what this is about. I've tried to convey what, what that is really all about. Um, so here we go with Blessed are the Merciful. Who but man... And who but man, who but man molests the lamb, takes him from his peaceful lee, spits upon him as he prays, nails him to a twisted tree, and keeps the doting you at bay. Who but man, and who but man, who but man doth hate the lamb, plays at cruelty all day long, Spares him from the dreaded knife. Savored torment, his sweet song. Prolong, prolong his wretched life. Who but man, and who but man? Who but man would slay the lamb? Yet from his high ungainly perch, Bloodied, broken, bruised, weak, he looks down on that blessed church. The gentle lamb begins to speak. Who but man, and who but man, who but man hath heard the lamb? Then summoning his greatest strength, the greatest power that e'er he taught, he wheels it there from one spear's length. Forgive them, Father, for they know not. Who but man, and who but man, who but cruel and heartless man, was e'er forgiven by the Lamb? And seeing all the multitudes, he went into the mountain, and looking down upon them, he did utter holy words, words of perfect righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Thank you. Wonderful man, great musician. <clears throat> Introduced everyone on stage, and I got tuned up for the first thing that I was going to play, which is in a very, very odd tuning. And then Nick introduced a thing where we all had to join in and play a solo. I discovered very quickly that I couldn't solo, I couldn't improvise in C sus two tuning. I'm just going to play. short little piece, written by a Canadian, but written in California, so written by André Marchand, who I met at this festival by chance some years ago, it was written in Bonnie Doon, California, it's called Le Matin de Bonnie Doon, Mornings at Bonnie Doon.
This little poem is about regret. <clears throat> I call it the uncollected dime. There can be no refund for the uncollected dime. No second chance to sail upon a tide that's come and gone. The sister's fate will cackle at the dream that slipped away and see your tears as wages for a debt you can't repay. And should you wait upon the shore bereft in endless rue, your dream upon the tide foregone will not return to you. For yesterday is ruthless, her name is penned in stone. She will not be corrected, though you tear your flesh from bone. Her verdict is beyond reproach, no convict may appeal. Her prison is the truth, and the truth she speaks, her seal. So will you serve your sentence as a boy or as a man, and look towards the east, and let the western sky be damned? The days will pass more quickly, and you will not feel alone. If you set another's happiness one mile beyond your own. Forget regrets collected on your lonely prison shelf and show the morning love that is not focused on yourself. For if yesterday was written by a foolish cocksure man, tomorrow will be written with the pen that's in your hand. He was born thirsty for the early morning sky. Inhaled the sun like orange juice and drank the bright dawn dry. He woke the sleeping swallow with his laughter and his tears while the world slept around him in his younger, wilder years. His pale blue eyes were question marks. His heart was on his sleeve and a dirge was on his lips, the full moon was bereaved. 
hidden in his breast, in a place he dare not name, a shattered heart kept time for the love that never came. And who in spring's bright morning, while the sun is in his way, thinks to count the hours while the lilacs bloom in May? And who, when they are parting in summer's youthful rain, never has the notion they might never meet again? I knew him in the night when the drunken moon did call, and in the squinting morning when contrition's tears did fall. And all the locals knew him too, his thumb out on the road, reflecting homeward lights like the ghost of Tom Joad. Now April is coming, ice is breaking on the shore, but that pale-eyed minstrel boy don't come around here anymore. Last time that I saw him, he was running for a train. Only time he had the sense to come in from the rain. And who in spring's bright morning, while the sun is in his way, thinks to count the hours while the lilacs bloom in May? And who when they are parting in summer's youthful rain ever has an ocean they might never meet again? Sometimes I miss that minstrel boy who drank the bright dawn dry. I guess I never thought he'd leave when I was young and high. I miss his easy laughter and I miss his easy tears. I miss his easy love in his younger, wilder years. Just once I caught a glimpse of him it took him by surprise. I could see the years written on those pale blue eyes. For there he stood before me, like a man out on parole. He was looking in the mirror and searching for his soul. And who in spring's bright morning, while the sun is in his way, thinks to count the hours while the lilacs bloom in May. And who, when they are parting in summer's youthful rain, ever has the notion they might never meet again. Twenty-nine years ago, I had the most remarkable dream, and all this time later, I still take comfort from it. I call this poem, Who But Daniel. I saw him in a dream so many years ago, laughter beyond measure from that small aortic flow. Even now, I cannot help but smile as I recall the way I knew his heart on that rainy night that fall. My voice was in his laughter and his joy was in my soul. His love was in my breast like the bonfires warming coals. And when I shook the sun and bade him wake the lazy day, Still, I felt his laughter, and it kept the rain at bay. And all day long I wondered who the laughing child could be, for I could not place his eyes, but his soul was known to me. And though he never spoke a word, his message was quite plain, that his heart was full of living, that his joy was unrestrained. And who could solve a dream like this but Daniel in the den? How does a soul know what to choose to show the love 
within. But that night the rain kept falling and his laughter left my ears. And it was the darkest evening, watered with the cruelest tears. For the hopeful place that we had set for one is yet to come would be taken from our table before the morning sun. Our tears were like November's darkened days of frozen rain. In the searing air we breathed, splinters pulled against the grain. And when the skies had cleared and the tears had drained away, I thought back to the recent dream I'd had upon that day. A laughing little boy without a single word to say, unbridled in his joy, like the leaping trout's ballet. Perhaps he made a shallow dive into the living stream, but still he saw the eddies where the sleeping rainbows dream. Perhaps he saw the sorrow that was coming on the dawn. And perhaps he let me know that the journey was still on. For who would share that dream but my Daniel in the den? And who knows what a soul might choose to show the love within? Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but me and Tony are of an age where we sometimes think, boy, if I had known then what I know now. I think we all think that from time to time. And that's what this little poem is about. Um, I call it the poet's advice to his younger self. If I could go back, talk to my 10 year old self I'd have a little advice for him <clears throat> go forth into that morning and ride towards the sun and climb your hundred apple trees before the day is done and never count the seconds or the paths your heart will trace and savor each sweet moment that the sun shines on your face and when the tide is out breathe deeply you are free assume the siren soul of the wild and restless sea and never waste the morning spent idle in your heart for the orbit of the planet seems much slower at the start but the days of endless summer and the everlasting nights are but a cruel illusion obscured by childhood's rites. And when your heart awakens and love comes to the fore, never leave those feelings stand outside the timid door. For the apple you leave hanging while you make your bashful plans will drop before the sun into another boy's keen hands. Beyond the squandered afternoon, when night drops like a stone, but one word written in your heart, and that word is alone. And if you'd see a sunrise that brings you peace of mind, above all things avoid the sting of acts that are unkind. For unkindness is a verdict for each petty schoolyard crime, and regret is but an echo that does not fade with time. So ride into that morning, go careless, swift, and free, and assume the siren's call of the morning's restless sea, and never leave a rosy apple hanging on the bough. Love as if the only moment left is here and now. And for each fallen sparrow who sports a broken wing, let kindness be the only song the day will hear you sing. 
So seize the day and love the way you'd have love come to you. May your kindness be as boundless as the ocean's deepest blue. Australia. He's, he's toured here numerous times. He said, oh, can I come along? I'll, I'll play some music behind your poetry. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so I'm very lucky to have uh, an artist of Tony's caliber come along and, 
add some color to my poems. <clears throat> a few years ago, I uh, wrote uh, 100 poems interpreting the paintings of Marc Chagall, an artist I've loved since I was a little boy, and that book is not published yet. It's with my agent, and he's pitching it to publishers. Um, but when I was writing the poems, uh, some of them ended up being prosaic. I would write little letters to Mr. Chagall. Dear Mark, how's it going? And, and I enjoyed the process of writing those Chagall poems so much, so immensely, that I still kind of keep in touch, as, as it were, uh, with Mark Chagall. Uh, if I see something really beautiful, I, I drop on the line. So where I live on Prince Edward Island, there's a beach. Uh, where I like to go and, and make little fires and write poetry. And it's a beautiful cove, and it's always, in my mind's eye, the shape of it has always looked like a person with their arms out, welcoming the beauty uh, that, that is everywhere. <clears throat> and um, so the beach, we, the locals, we call it uh, Kepik Kinloch, and so uh, a lot of Scots, uh, PEI. And I call this Letter from Kinloch on Thirst. These tidal flats are anxious, Mark, for one who is endearing, a child as bright as you to lift them to the easel of posterity. My cold is open-armed like a singer on a stage before his final bow ready for those rolling waves of love, beating on the shores of affirmation, up and down the coast of aspiration. For each man has a canvas in his heart, Chagall, but only those so favored by the gods as you may save a day like this with oil and sable, mixed with love and gratitude, that willing hearts like mine might still behold its steady burn through days of rain and cold that seem eternal. And those who turn the seagull's carefree flight to buoyant notes, caressed of wood and string, pluck wonder like a harp from the ether of the firmament and hold it for all mankind as a prayer offered to artistry and witnessed by the love of God himself. For God did not make souls in the forge of his ambition for labor or for tedium, but as a constant craving for righteousness and beauty. For what is wine, Chagall? No matter what the vintage, no matter it be red as blood, or fragrant as a rose, if not for thirst. This is what a soul is for, and God's unyielding gift to man is more than simple beauty. His greatest of all gifts, Chagall is thirst. For the tree whose roots reach deep into a watery source will never cast an anxious glance onto the blue horizon for a promissory note of cotton tumbleweeds rolling in from heaven like a sob to soothe the cracked hard skin of River Jordan. And they who thirst in winter's bleakest days and yearn for one small ember in the hour of total darkness when the whereabouts of Saul are yet unknown, turn hopefully to those as you who fill the world with color and the air with trills and harmonies to keep the red breast sharp and save the brightest notes, rays of warming sunshine for the darkest days of winter. For such as these are mirrors to reflect back unto God those places in our hearts like this, my lonely cove, before the blossoms yet have shown the blush upon their cheeks unto the morning. Always, dear Chagall, whenever I see beauty, taste it in the air, feel it in the burn of salty streams along my cheeks, do I sense the love of God imbued unto my breast. For those who paint their small bouquets raise their holy voices and share the tender gift of their affection with we who live in poverty of spirit through the night and who daily yearn for beauty and devotion. Your most affectionate friend in poetry, Bob. Um, a 
couple of years ago, it was coming up on Christmas and I took a, a frozen spruce tree um, that we had picked up out of the cold and I brought it in the house and we put it in a stand, let it thaw and we were gonna decorate it. And about an hour later, <clears throat> we saw some movement in the branches, a little uh, bit of yellow kind of moving in there and, and this beautiful swallowtail butterfly uh, emerged and the resilience of that tiny, fragile little creature seemed to me to be a metaphor uh, because I had been thinking uh, during the lead up to Christmas about all the, the people who were gone, the people, you know, grandparents and old friends who, were, who have left us. And uh, so I wrote this little poem and actually Tony and I uh, recorded it and we released it as a single and uh, we picked up uh, little bits and pieces of uh, airplay all over the world uh, which we're very grateful for and uh, so this is The Swallowtail. The Swallowtail. December had embraced the land with solemn arms of clay. No swallowtail to cheer the frozen meadow with its play. The lupin and the lady slipper lost in deep repose. Likewise, the singing cricket where the morning glory rose. Oh, where the song of summer the meadow did lament. The fledgling and the swallowtail, the lavender's sweet scent. Oh, where are the kids of April, the downy winds of June? The bleeding lamb held to my breast beneath the swollen moon. Gone into the stillness, the cold north wind replied. Gone into December's quick embrace, the mistral cried. I took a frozen spruce in from the cold to cheer my night. pagan's light. The branches warmed had soon performed a curtsy and a sigh, while bowing low before his soul was sent a mile high. And when at last the spruce was cheerful and pleased to share its light, I spied a glint of yellow emerging in the night. Upon a limb of needles, pristine, a newly wakened swallowtail began to speak to me. Oh, do not mourn the swallowtail, the cricket, and the rose. Do not lament the sun's descent when cold the north wind blows. For deep December's bluster has hidden us from sight. But you shall see Persephone will free us from this night. Spring will follow winter as dawn will follow night, and we are always close at hand. We keep you in our sight. All through the merry season did the swallowtail abide, a yellow hint of sunshine when the night was cold outside. But as the days grow longer and the warming spring draws nigh, Oft I catch a glint of yellow in the corner of my eye. Thank you. So we've got time for a couple more here. going to get the cane out here. Um, I read Woody Guthrie's autobiography when I was 15 and 
and uh, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to get out and hitchhike and busk and write songs and see the world. And so I went to sea and I, <coughs> I hitchhiked from Alaska down as far south as Juarez, Mexico. And I did busking in New York City and San Francisco and all over the place. I lived like that for years. And uh, it was a great adventure. Uh, and in 1982, during the recession, which was brutal. I found myself uh, in the deep south, in the deep American south, in the city of Tampa. And uh, for a while that winter, we lived on the street and uh, it, it was nothing like anything I had ever experienced and certainly nothing I would hope to ever experience again. So um, this will be our last one. I, I would like to thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your kindness. Uh, I'd like to thank Tony, of course, the Tex, and the festival people, Caroline from uh, Port Ferry. Um, I will mention that we have merch out on the table. I have a, a recording of songs and one of music and poetry, and Tony has two CDs out there. And if you're from Melbourne, we're going to be at the Spotted Mallard on Tuesday. of Tampa, where perdition and salvation walked together, and shared the darkened corners where the wayward lay their heads when soul reposes. Was it winter or recession that brought the great migration, providence or desperation that pulled us to your heart? Such cruelty I had not yet imagined, broken men ignited, Midnight torches like Nero's brilliant Christians, illuminating Roman streets with oil and wood and murder. Such benevolence I had not yet imagined, kindness and charity that I did report as sacraments. And who were you, JC, with the initials of the Savior and the piercing eyes of the devil? How did you come to purchase your accommodation in the cruel cage of Attica? What was the dark heart of your secret? Was it murder or something more sinister? For a soul can no worse stain than the lethal mark of Cain. We did not steal, but we ate the food you'd stolen. We did not trust you, but we let you watch our backs. For hunger and weakness are not so discerning as abundance and strength. We three, each in our own way, sought the eye of the needle, the narrow gate into the holy city. I dismounted and found it on the street, and beneath the bridges were bedrolls and refuse pass for an abode. For the gate was not a golden arch, but a broken road trodden by the unholy, the unclean, the untouchables. You too saw it in the Charlemagne's false prophet who offered salvation for one hundred dollars, but whose pernicious spell dissipated like the early morning fog before the sun at Tampa's heavy dawn. Tampa, thou holy city, Tampa, thou son of perdition, where salvation was offered for beggar's alms, and hobos carried scripture. In a little church on Franklin Street, I met one of your prophets, an old street fighter whose road to Damascus ended in the holy city, Tampa. He spoke to the killers, he preached to the whores, reached out to the junkies with dead eyes and open sores, gave hope to the hopeless with words like a dart, past tired ears to pierce broken hearts, Sons of perdition, granted exemption, atoned and traded for priceless redemption. I saw her at the organ, old and frail, erect and fearless, amazing grace and dignity and stature. A broken 
Mormon man approached her dressed in rags and gaunt and cheerless, amazing fodder for the coming rapture, told her a tale of hopelessness, of solitude and pain, how he'd failed both God and man, how his life was but a stain, saw the goodness in her eyes as she took his filthy hands, raised her voice to heaven to invoke the Son of Man. The prayer that flowed was canticle, the tears that flowed a river, the tongues of fire above their heads gave my soul a shiver. A Pentecostal prayer in a language known to God raised a broken man to ecstasy, benediction we did laud, felt his presence in the room, Touch my heart, his grace like Moses' staff, making scenes of sorrow part. Heard his voice against the wind, saw his face against the sun, felt his sorrow on my cheeks when the deluge had begun. Knew his grace as I lay sleeping, assailable, exposed, beneath the open sky, in exhaustion's deep repose. For we had no door to sprinkle. No dispatch in the night. We beseech thee, pass us over until morning's cherished light. For we too might well have been enkindled in the night, like Nero's brilliant Christians, to give the pagans light. If thou wouldst seek the holy city, seek thee not a gate of gold. For the secret of the portal has two thousand years been told. It is a rough hewn highway the unholy seek to tread. Must count ourselves among them, see that they are loved and fed. For the architect of Eden and the one whose gate we seek walked with such as these the lost, the lame, the meek. To reach that holy city and that splendid rest of seat, walk thee not only among them, but anoint their blistered feet. Gather thee the stragglers from Medusa's drifting raft. That when he sees thee coming, he might kill the fatted calf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. A perfectly matched duo there, reflective and ethereal. Let's thank again uh, Bob McJensen and Tony McManus.